it's time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink and listen. The late night creature feature in Pompeii, Indiana. There's an almost universal feeling of discomfort and unease that a person experiences when they see a deserted place that their mind tells them should be full of people. A stark feeling of wrongness and creeping dread that is perhaps a holdover from our animalistic ancestors, meant to warn us when danger is fast approaching. I think most people are familiar with the sensation, but few know that it has a name. Kinopsia. Kinopsia is defined by the Dictionary of Obscure Sorrows as the eerie, forlorn atmosphere of a place that's usually bustling with people, but is now abandoned and quiet. Like a school hallway in the evening, long after classes have let out, an unlit office building over the weekend, a store display window after dark, or vacant fairgrounds totally devoid of anyone to enjoy them. Basically, it's a kind of emotional afterimage that creates a feeling of not just emptiness, but hyper-emptiness, the kind that seeps into the soul. In a way, it could be described as a kind of haunting, but rather than being haunted by some lingering supernatural malignancy, one who experiences canopsia is haunted by what is not there but should be. I've experienced canopsia on several occasions throughout my comparatively short life, but the one that stands out in my memory is the night my older brother Caleb and I found ourselves in a place called Pompeii, Indiana, after a long night of driving aimlessly down some back roads high on psychedelics. Now I'm certain that many rational people will use my admission that I was using drugs that night as an excuse to dismiss the entire experience as a simple hallucination brought on by intoxication. And that'd be fair. I may have been inclined to do the same were I in their shoes. But one cannot hallucinate the deep scars that now mark my body to this day. I've yet to find a drug that could cause a person to simply cease to exist in the way I witnessed that night, but, well, I digress. You will not find Pompeii, Indiana on any map, and Google searches of the town's name will best give you the address of a pizza place in Lake County, as well as a large serving of disappointment and palpable frustration. Believe me, I've tried. My attempts to retrace the journey my brother and I took and to pin down an exact geographic location of the town I very nearly lost my life in have so far proven to be futile. The most I can tell you is that it should be located somewhere about two and a half hours south of Indianapolis, as far as I could tell. Well, when you're tripping on acid, it's hard to keep track of landmarks and road signs amidst the backdrop of ever-shifting kaleidoscopic hallucinations and euphoric sensations that demand your attention for hours at a time. Honestly, in hindsight, it's a miracle that we didn't crash the car. I'd say we were lucky, but knowing where we ended up, that would be a lie. It all started at our parents' house in Brownsburg, Indiana, around midnight. Our folks had just left for an out-of-state vacation that Caleb and I had declined to accompany them on, with the somewhat plausible excuse that neither of us could take the time off of work that would have been required to accompany them. But, uh, in reality... He and I had been strategically planning to embrace the golden opportunity that was their absence, to have a drug-fueled night of excitement, ever since we'd learned that they were going on vacation some months prior. Our parents had barely made it out of the driveway and down the dimly lit street before Caleb dashed up to his room on the second floor of our three-story house and quickly returned with what looked to be a wad of aluminum foil and a mischievous twinkle in his eyes. Oh man, bro... It's going to be so fucking sweet, he'd said. He then wasted no time placing the wad on the kitchen counter and unwrapping it with care, revealing what looked like neatly cut little paper squares that were small enough to fit on the tip of a finger. I being the younger of the two of us, and at the time woefully inexperienced in the world of controlled substances, felt a mixture of exhilaration and nervousness as Caleb instructed me to take one of the paper squares from the foil and place it under my tongue only to be very underwhelmed by the lack of any detectable changes in my perceptions after the first couple of minutes. I don't feel anything, Caleb. Are you sure your guy didn't sell you bullshit? I asked him, with concern and impatience seeping into my voice. Caleb chuckled as if I'd said something extremely childish before reassuring me. Give it time. The chemicals take a while to reach the brain. 
Well, how will I know when it's working? Trust me, you'll know. Well, I took him at his word, and we spent the next 45 minutes or so just hanging out in our spacious living room, flipping absent-mindedly through channels on the TV, waiting for the acid to work its magic. When I made the suggestion that I'd regret for the rest of my natural life. I'm hungry, man. Why don't we go down the street real quick and grab something to eat before we're both too high to function? Caleb, being the only one out of the two of us with a license and a car, scratched his head as if weighing the pros and cons of the idea before he conceded with a shrug. Sure, as long as it's just down the street and back, we should be okay. Well, my vision was starting to vibrate at this point. And any notion of how dangerous getting into a car in the state we were in was chased away by the marvellous visions that had begun dancing before my eyes. Well, after a few minutes of fumbling around through the fastly developing wonderland that was forming around us for our coats, shoes and Caleb's keys, both of us somewhat clumsily loaded ourselves into Caleb's Silverado, pulled out of the driveway and proceeded down the street toward a string of local fast food places at a languid pace. Well, it's worth mentioning at this part of my story that Caleb had a terrible sense of direction, one that I and practically everybody that knew him teased him for relentlessly. He'd often get lost driving to the houses of friends that lived just a few blocks over. Well, this, coupled with the fact that both of us were now tripping balls on acid, well, it should come as no surprise that Caleb somehow managed to completely pass the fast food joints and steer us onto the highway. We were both so far gone that we must have driven for a good twenty minutes before either of us realized that we were lost. And once we did, we were basically the blind leading the blind, both of us arguing back and forth about which turn to make and which exit to use, when neither of us really had any idea of where the hell we were going. It wasn't all bad to tell you the truth. I mean, in some ways, it was a lot of fun. Our short trip to get fast food had become an all-out psychedelic adventure through the open fields and winding country roads of our little slice of the Midwest. We laughed, joked, and argued, and debated with one another about all manner of things while we looked in awe at the sights and sensations the drug we'd both taken was producing for us. Eventually, though, as it became clear to both of us that we were thoroughly lost with the way back to the house nowhere in sight, we agreed that it would be best to stop somewhere and get our bearings, maybe even get a hotel for the night, until we were clear-minded enough to find our way back home, even though the prospect of trying to have normal social interactions with anyone, given how high we both were, seemed like a Herculean task. And that was when I first noticed the ashes that fell from the otherwise clear summer sky like snow. I dismissed it as just another hallucination at first, Gradually, though, as it started to collect on the windshield and obstruct our vision to the point where Caleb had to turn on his windshield wipers so he could drive safely, I realised that it was real. I turned to Caleb for verification of this, on the off chance that I was just hallucinating. Hey man, do you see that? Yeah man, it's really weird. Yeah, totally weird. After driving for another few miles down the road through the strangest weather phenomenon either of us had ever experienced, we saw a large, weathered old sign in the distance that was all faded paint and rotting wood that read, Welcome to Pompeii, Indiana, in big, bold letters, overlooking what seemed to be a decent-sized town complete with a motel, a gas station, a town hall, a diner, a school, a few rows of old-looking houses here and there, and what from the distance looked like an old-school drive-in movie theatre, all covered in a slowly growing blanket of ashes. Well, it wasn't exactly inviting, but any port will do in a storm, as the saying goes, so we decided to check it out. If a town could ever be accurately compared to a recently hollowed-out corpse, then Pompeii would definitely be the perfect candidate for that comparison. Everywhere we looked, we were confronted by a complete and utter lack of any noticeable signs of human life, or any life at all for that matter, despite the fact that in contrast to the weathered old sign that had welcomed us in, nothing we saw looked particularly old or dilapidated at all. In fact, some of the machines and appliances left scattered around the apparently abandoned buildings showed clear signs of recent use. 
We stopped at the gas station first to fill up and grab some snacks, since neither of us had eaten anything since our ill-fated journey had begun. And what we saw once we passed through the open glass double doors and made our way inside was equal parts confusing and unsettling. Directly in front of us was a row of about six or so commercial coffee pots that had all still had steam rising out of their tops, as if freshly brewed. Off to the left was the checkout counter where the register drawer stood open and a pack of cigarettes lay on its side next to it, as if whoever had been working the counter had just set them down in the middle of ringing them up and just left without even bothering to close the drawer. The air pump out in the parking lot was running, although... There were no cars anywhere in sight, and since those machines generally tend to run for only about a few minutes at most after someone puts enough quarters in it, logically speaking, someone had to have turned it on in the last few minutes. But there were no visible signs of anyone that I could see, nor were there any obvious clues to where the people who had to have lived there had gone. No tracks in the ash that blanketed the ground, no hastily handwritten notes saying, Mail to lunch or offering any kind of explanation to where the fuck everyone was. It, well, it was just deafening silence, and a profound feeling of isolation. It wasn't just the gas station either. Everywhere we looked, the outcome was the same. The diner was all but abandoned. Its retro interior clearly meant to replicate the atmosphere of a 1950s burger joint. It was totally barren. No people anywhere to be seen, though almost every single table was loaded with at least five or six plates of food apiece, all of which were still warm to the touch, as if the place had been packed with families getting ready to enjoy a hearty evening meal with one another just a few moments earlier, before they just left and went somewhere, somehow. Just like at the gas station, we could see no cars in sight. We stopped for a moment to help ourselves to a few plates of the abandoned meals before checking out a few of the other buildings, namely the derelict motel and a few of the houses, only to find more of the same. At this point in our journey, the hallucinogenic effects of the acid we'd taken was beginning to work against Caleb and I. Our feelings of carefree foolishness and euphoria had morphed into unease and steadily growing paranoia, and the acid was only amplifying that. Everywhere I looked, I saw shadows moving in the periphery of my vision, but whenever I turned to confront them, they'd be gone. I could feel sweat starting to gather on my forehead and a cold, tingling feeling start to crawl up the small of my back. And Caleb wasn't doing much better. I could see him visibly shaking and watched his eyes dart from side to side in rapid, panicky movements as he paced back and forth in the empty motel parking lot where both of us now stood next to the parked Silverado, trying to figure out what to do next. His face had begun to contort and wilt, almost like it was melting off of his head the longer I stood and stared at him. I had to verbally remind myself that his face only looked that way because I was on drugs, but, well, the more I repeated it to myself, the more it sounded like a lie. Calm down. You're tripping. Everything's fine. Everything's fine. I repeated to myself, like a prayer. Where the fuck is everyone? Caleb had yelled in transparent frustration, now looking only vaguely recognizable as himself to my eyes. His normally unkempt sandy blonde hair now looked blue and tattered, and his head had swelled to at least twice its regular size. His mouth was lopsided, and only a single glassy eye could be seen on his now horribly distorted face. I must have been gawking at him with wide-eyed terror because he stopped pacing for a minute to see what was up with me. Hey, you okay? Do I have something on my face? I bit back the urge to tell him he looked like a freaking alien out of one of those low-budget 80s horror movies and did my best to respond with coherent sentences. No, no, you're fine. I'm just really fucking high and I don't want to be here. Well, neither do I. Fuck this, man. Let's just get the hell out of here. Literally anywhere would be better than here. Agreed. And with that, we hopped back into the Silverado and gunned down the road, back towards the highway, maintaining a very tense silence between the two of us as we went. Neither of us could really put into words at that time, but we felt in our bones that something was very off about that place. 
The ashes that fell from the sky had ceased gently falling like snow and now whirled around the truck like winds of a blizzard, devouring the highway in front of us. And even after Caleb had turned his brights on, we could only see maybe a few feet of road in front of us. We didn't care. We just wanted to get out of that place as fast as we could. We didn't make turns and we sure as shit didn't turn around. I'm sure of it. Yet after about 15 minutes or so of gunning it down the highway as fast as we could, we were once again face to face with that decrepit, rotting old sign that read, Welcome back to Pompeii, Indiana. Without skipping a beat, Caleb whipped the truck around and took off in the opposite direction, only to have the same thing happen again, and another time after that. After we found ourselves in front of that goddamn sign for the fifth time, I remember pounding my fist against the dash out of sheer frustration before I turned and started screaming at my brother. What the fuck is wrong with you? You have one job, Caleb, and that's to get us the fuck out of here. Why is that so freaking hard? Caleb didn't respond to me right away. He just sat there staring at the eroded, ancient-looking sign with an expression of pure bewilderment. His face looked relatively normal to me now, which made no sense given that he told me that the acid we took usually lasted about nine hours on average, and there was simply no way that nine hours had passed already. I, uh, I don't know. This was all he could manage to say. That was when I noticed the drive-in movie theatre in the distance, or, more specifically, that there seemed to be a movie playing on the towering projection screen. It was almost impossible to make out what was playing from that distance, but regardless, the sight filled me with a desperate kind of hope because, after all, if a movie was playing, that meant someone had to be down there working the projector and maybe that someone can tell us what the hell was going on. Hey, there's a movie playing down there, I said, pointing to the drive-in. Caleb followed my finger with his gaze down to the drive-in and at the movie playing on the screen before looking back at me with a confused look. So? What do you mean, so? If there's a movie playing, then there have to be people down there. Oh, we, we can't be sure of that. Well, do you have any better ideas about what we should do? I'll tell you what we should do. We should stay the fuck away from that town. This is beyond creepy. Do what? Sit here forever? There could be someone down there who could help us. Caleb conceded with a frown. God, I don't like this, bro. I don't like this at all. He then put the truck back into drive and reluctantly took us back through the deserted streets of Pompeii towards the theatre. And since I can say with confidence that I was totally clear-minded at this point, I noticed small details here and there that I'd totally overlooked before. When we passed the empty church building, for instance, I saw a rather ominous message scrawled on the sidewalk just outside the main entrance that read, Here, we were deceived. The more I looked around, the more I found that similar messages had been scrawled along the entranceways and sidewalks of, well, several places all around town. One such message, inscribed along the sidewalk that bordered the diner read, Here, we went unnourished. Yet another that I saw written outside of the town hall read, Here we were betrayed. But the message that was easily the most unsettling out of all the ones I saw was the one scrawled over the faded sign over the entrance to the drive in itself that read, Here we bore witness. The gate itself hung open and offered an unobstructed path into the theatre which seemed to consist of a large open parking area that, unlike virtually anywhere else in town, was packed with cars from end to end, and what looked like some sort of concession stand located roughly at its centre. We could see the dim silver light of the projector as it filled the enormous screen at the northernmost end of the drive-in, with what looked like an old-fashioned black-and-white movie that hadn't seemed to have progressed past its opening credits. Names of actors and companies I'd never heard of scrolled slowly down the length of the screen before the movie opened to a scene of an idyllic-looking Midwestern town overlooked by a starry night sky that, 
well, in some ways resembled the one we now found ourselves in. Before I could turn to Caleb and discuss what we should have done next, the screeching static of the Silverado's radio pierced the silence that prevailed between the two of us, before it morphed into what we assumed was the radio that accompanied the movie. At first, it was this really corny-sounding jingle, the likes of which you'd expect to see on an old commercial. Then it abruptly became a loud crashing sound as one of the stars that graced that beautiful night sky on the screen fell to earth below and made a large crater in the woods just outside of the town. The scene then shifted to a young boy who looked to be around high school age, walking through those same woods alone in the daytime. He wandered around aimlessly until he happened upon the crater, which had by then been filled up to the edges with a strange, viscous black liquid. The boy then sat along the edge of the pool, regarding it curiously, as if debating with himself about whether or not he wanted to touch it, when a stream of bubbles rose up to the pool centre and started to pop one after the other, and each pop bubble carried with it a word from a voice that sounded remarkably human, almost like that of a young girl. Hello? Who are you? The voice asked. Each syllable sounded strained and unnatural, as if whatever was making them had not quite mastered human speech. The boy, for his part, seemed shocked at first, but his shock quickly changed into rapt fascination, and he started talking back. Hello? I'm Ronnie, he said. Ronnie? The voice echoed. Who are you? I am lost. Lost? The boy named Ronnie repeated, sounding confused. Lost? I am lost. I want to go home. Can I help? Small. I'm too small. I must grow. <laughs> you must grow? Ronnie repeated, his face suddenly becoming vacant and expressionless. He then turned and walked in the opposite direction, back towards town, repeating, She must grow. She must grow. To himself, like a mantra. The scene then changed again, this time showing Ronnie and another boy who was approximately the same age, walking through the same woods toward the pool. It's just this way. Ronnie said, his voice distant and unnatural, which didn't seem to be lost on the other boy. Sure, Ronnie. Whatever you say. Are you feeling okay? You sound weird. I'm fine. We're almost there. The boy didn't seem reassured, but went along regardless. When the pair finally came upon the pool once again, Ronnie gestured to it with veneration. The other boy seemed to think it was mesmerizing. He knelt by the edge and watched the bubbling black liquid with wide-eyed fascination, while Ronnie slowly and subtly maneuvered behind it. This is so cool, Ronnie. What is it? The boy was barely able to utter the word it before Ronnie pushed him in with all the force he could muster, and upon making physical contact with the liquid, the other boy let out a heartbreaking scream. Oily black tendrils reached up from the depths of the pool, and constricted around him like pythons. You could hear the sickening sound of his bones snapping as the tendrils began pulling him down, slowly but surely. He thrashed around and cried out desperately for his friend to help him, but Ronnie remained still, and just watched the horror unfolding in front of him with that same vacant, dispassionate look in his eyes. She must grow, he said. Eventually, the other boy vanished beneath the liquid completely, and the pool began to expand ever so slightly, the black ooze flowing past its edges. No more words were spoken aloud between Ronnie and the entity inside the pool, but he seemed to be aware of its will nonetheless. The next few scenes played out in a similar fashion, Ronnie luring hapless victims to their inevitable fate in the woods, and the pool steadily expanding with each new sacrifice. Before long, the pool had become a large pond, and not long after that, a small lake. As it grew, it devoured the plant life it came into contact with voraciously. 
trees and other vegetation that were unfortunate enough to be in its path withered and died almost before my eyes as I watched that horrible black ooze creep ever closer to the town itself. Though it was never explicitly stated by any of the characters, I got the distinct impression after the pool had expanded past a certain point, the entity no longer needed to rely on Ronnie for sustenance. Before long, others began to do its bidding as well. In one scene, a pastor of the local church led his day's congregation into the dying woods and the edge of the Black Ooze for baptism, and then watched them all die in the depths of that murky blackness one after another, before walking into the pool himself with the most contented smile across his face as he did. In yet another scene, I couldn't bring myself to watch all the way through, a school bus driver veers off the road with a look of total vacancy in his eyes and puts his foot to the gas as he drives towards the woods with reckless abandon and a busload of terrified kids. The film reached its climax when open conflict broke out between a group of townspeople who seemed to have retained their minds and those that had fallen under the sway of the voice from the pool. The conflict had been short and bloody, and although the townspeople had fought like cornered animals, they were ultimately subdued and corralled like livestock by their possessed neighbours. I scarcely have the words to describe the cold and detached depravity I witnessed on that screen. I've never considered myself the squeamish type, and I'd seen a lot of documentaries about things like the Holocaust and the Rwandan genocide in school growing up so I wasn't totally unfamiliar with the concept of one group of humans setting out to systematically exterminate another, but what I saw on that screen was not like those events at all. There was no anger and no malice in it, no zealous demagogues spewing hateful rhetoric. The day's servants of the alien entity carried out their atrocity in near total silence. They didn't even speak to each other. One by one, they either bound people they'd likely known their whole lives with duct tape and ropes, scavenged from around town, and dragged them out into the woods completely oblivious to their pain cries and desperate pleas for mercy, or they simply beat them until they could no longer resist. In one instance, I saw a large man break the legs of a woman who could easily have been in her eighties before he hoisted her over his shoulder and carried her off into the blackness. In another... I saw a woman strangling a small girl that was her spitting image into unconsciousness and then carrying her limp form to the woods. Once everyone had been gathered up and brought to the edge of that liquid abyss that had swelled to far beyond its original size, what I can only describe as a kind of grotesque ritual took place. The elderly and infirm were pushed in first. Then came the men and afterward the women, until only the children remained. I thought that the children would meet the same awful fate, only to be temporarily relieved when that didn't happen. Instead, I witnessed each and every one of the possessed people walk into the ooze and perish with joyous smiles painted on their dazed faces, leaving the children of the town bound and alone for several moments before the boy called Ronnie emerged from the depths of the ooze and walked out onto the land, looking simultaneously younger and also ageless. The dark liquid of the pool fell from his eyelids and ran down his cheeks like teardrops, and a chillingly warm smile stretched across his freckled face. He spoke to the terrified little ones in a voice that was his own, and at the same time, not. Hello. Are you lost? Do you want to go home? He asked. Common sense dictated that he was speaking to the children on the screen, but the angle of the camera made it seem as though he was speaking to me directly, and that made my blood run cold. The children's response to his question came in the form of gargled cries and terrified whines. Don't be afraid, little ones. We'll all go home soon. Look how she has grown, he said as he turned to the ooze-filled crater with his arms outstretched as that thing slowly rose out of the pit. I've tried so hard to purge the image from my mind over the years with drugs, booze, and even blunt force trauma, but none of it could expel the image of those great black wings that eclipsed the moon and the stars. No amount of physical trauma could exercise the sight of its ten heads and seven horns, each bellowing black ash and fire into the sky. 
Through Ronnie, I heard it speak, each and every one of its blasphemous names, each more terrible than the last. I heard it speak of its home in the black void beyond the stars where all light goes to die, of the utter apathy of God and the complete meaningless of my own existence. At that point, I lost conscious awareness that I was watching just a movie, and I heard myself scream. Panic set in and I clawed frantically at the truck's door, only to find that Caleb had locked it. In the same instant that I realised this, I felt his hand on my shoulder, and I whipped around to see a serene, peaceful look on his face as black tears fell down his cheeks. It's alright, brother. We're lost no more. It's time to go home. He said in that voice that was not his own as he wrapped his hands around my neck. I struggled against his grip but couldn't break free. Through the haziness of my oxygen-deprived brain, I could see Caleb's skin begin to bubble and blister as if it had been exposed to unimaginably high temperatures before I saw my brother erupt into blue flames, all while keeping that same serene expression on his face as he began to burn away. Out of sheer strength brought on by mortal terror, I threw him off of me, busted the passenger window with my elbow, and scrambled out and away from the Silverado just as the entire thing burst into flames. I then looked on in horror as my brother burned away into nothingness, so that not even a body remained, just the burned-out husk of a vehicle and an empty feeling of despair. The unnatural storm of ashes that had dogged us throughout this ill-fated journey had whipped up to unbelievable speeds at this point, pelting my skin and stinging my eyes, though I hardly noticed it. In truth, I felt I was going to die, and I was okay with it. I didn't want to be in that awful place alone. I laid on the cold asphalt and gravel, waiting for death's embrace only to find myself in an unfamiliar hospital bed when I next opened my eyes. Over the next several days, I'd learned that I'd been found unconscious on the side of the highway by a passing trucker who'd in turn called the police and got me to a hospital. After I was awake and coherent enough to tell the doctors who I was and my family's contact information, my parents soon rushed over and nearly pulled me out of the bed when they embraced me. I was as grateful to see them as they were to see me, but they brought with them questions I really didn't know how to answer. Where did you go? What happened to you? And then, of course, the most painful question of them all. Where is Caleb? I had no words to form an answer, and I doubt they would have believed me if I did anyway. But my silence told them enough. I can still hear my mother's pain sobs that penetrated the thin walls of my room from outside in the hallway, and my father's softly spoken reassurances that did no real good. Eventually, the police came by to ask very similar questions, and they wouldn't take silence for an answer. The detective who I spoke with was a reserved and professional man who was very careful with his words, but I could tell that he didn't believe me when I told him that I had no recollection of what had happened to me and Caleb that night. It'd be better for you in the long run if you told the whole truth, son, he told me. I knew that the whole truth would likely just land me in a mental wall, maybe even jail, and so I said nothing. Without any concrete evidence of foul play, the police eventually eased off of me. That didn't stop the rumours and the gossip around town, or the cold stares I got from people I passed on the street. In the absence of a true telling of events, it's human nature to construct your own, and the version of events that ended up circulating around town was that I'd murdered Caleb over drugs, or that maybe he'd overdosed on something and I'd left him to die. None of that was true, but people believed it and treated me accordingly. I was effectively a total pariah by the end of the month. That wasn't the worst of it, though. Those things all paled in comparison to the feeling I felt whenever I had walked by Caleb's empty room, which, in the months and years following his death, had become a kind of shrine to his memory. Whenever I look at his room now, I know what it is to be haunted. Real hauntings don't come from wraiths or spirits, but from memories, and the knowledge that someone who should be there is not. 
that detective still comes around every now and again to check on me and to ask if I'm ready to talk, though I always tell him that I have nothing to say. In a strange way, he's become like my only friend. I think I may tell him everything one day, when I have nothing else to lose and I can hold on to this thing no longer. There is no happy ending to my story. Only a plea that you cherish those you love because you never know when they'll be gone from the world forever. And a warning that, if you ever find yourself in Pompeii, Indiana, for the love of God, stay away from the theatre. Stay away from the late night creature feature. The last drive-in theatre. I ever visited. This is the story of a monster. My name's Harold Brown. I'm six foot one, built like a Viking. Short and thick tree trunk legs, huge torso, big paunch, thick blonde hair, blue eyes, hair everywhere and gigantic arms capped by ham-sized fists. Suffice to say, when I go to Renaissance fairs, it's always as William Wallace. I go to a university in California, one of the last good ones, a hidden gem, really. And five months ago, I met my girlfriend, Cassandra. How we met is the stuff of, at once, dreams and nightmares. I was behind her in a drive through late at night and saw some guy climb into her car. I followed after her, frantically honking and flashing my brights to get her attention. But she evaded me, not knowing of the monster hiding behind her. Because I grew up on the farms and ranches surrounding this town, I quickly located the back roads they'd gone down and called in the police. Cassandra was still alive. I met with her again after she was released from the hospital. I knew I had to ask her out after the cops tried to take the bag of fast food that was in her car for evidence and she ferociously snatched it back and mauled the burger in half a minute in spite of being stark as and red as a tomato from head to toe thanks to the bleach she'd been dunked in by that psycho. Coffee. Movies. The great hole in the wall restaurants I know around town. None of which were drive through since she'd officially sworn off of them. And whatever else a pair of students on a shoestring budget could manage. Her cascade of wine-red hair, which reminded me of my field of study. Her mother-of-pearl skin and her vibrant blue eyes all marked a young woman who knew her way around an animal cell. I'd regale her with talk of wine and winemaking. Geekery. The time I was shot while working as a security guard at the Santa Barbara County Fair and Expo. And books I grew up with. Star Wars' expanded universe. Raptor Red and Snow Crash, if you must know. And she would bless my ears with descriptions of cellular mitosis. Star Trek, which got her into science because Mr. Spock's her hero. Oh, and Mystery Science Theater 3000. I was already a fan, but she helped me truly appreciate the skits in between the movie segments. <laughs> she called me her big Viking wolf. I call her my little Spitfire Fox. To be honest, I probably wouldn't have met or talked to her or any other girl there at that university. It's not that I'm shy. Of the Myers-Briggs personality types, I'm an INFJ. Introverted, intuitive, feeling, judging. The rarest of them all. Great privacy, but great empathy. A healer, a crowd-pleaser but someone preferring their alone time and their own headspace. But more than just that, I struggle with feelings of intense self-hatred, none of which manifest on the surface because my nurturing nature doesn't want to spread that around. How do I find validation? Through helping others. Counselling helped and probably saved my life, but that self-hatred still pops up. All of it prompted by a traumatic three years when I was nine at the hands of an ex-sister-in-law. But for now, these days, I had managed to find a wonderful young woman who saw past my imperfections to the person under the carefully constructed mask. Oh, 
dating bliss at last. We had to be careful, though. In our town, there's a significant homeless population, and some gangs, too. Most of the latter didn't bother with students, unless someone was behind on a drug tab, and most students' vices were beer and video games. In the former, well, they were usually pretty chill. There's even a mural of one, dubbed the Pirate, thanks to his eye patch and haggard demeanour. Every time a student would see him, they'd pump a fist and shout, Arr, matey! And the pirate would shout, Arr, matey, back. Nice guy. Loves Doz Equus beer, and if you buy him a drink or sandwich, he'll regale you with stories from his time working on a freight ship that are so outlandish and so ridiculous, they absolutely must be true. Unicorn Man. So named for the single dreadlock sticking up from his head at all times. Well, he was a professor at the university until something he was researching just broke his mind. The cop, named because of the tattered police shirt and cop hat he wore, was an abandoned Down syndrome baby. But the man could be trusted to walk women safely home on dark and frightening nights. Yeah, real class act, the cop. Then there's some of the unsafe ones. The Martian, who thinks aliens are going to invade. Pigpen, who's only held together by all the parasites he carries holding hands. And Tapeworm, who has a dried up, crap spattered tail sticking out of his hands that's composed of the half dead tapeworms dangling out of him and keeps yelling about how his son was taken by polar bears. He was just a student that cracked from pressure and never went home. He'd become violent towards anyone with a small dog or cat, demanding they give him his son back and then spend a night in jail. Once upon a time, we had institutions that helped these people, but because a relative few psychos turned them into their own personal Dr. Mengler playgrounds, well, they mostly got closed down. Things everywhere would have been different if these folks got the help they needed. Oh, but, well, I digress. One evening, when we'd finished our studies over a plate of taquitos and guacamole that had grown cold and limp and dark green, respectively, Cassandra looked up from her book and shut it with a heavy thud. Let's go see a movie, she exclaimed, grinning that adorable way that she did. Oh, as long as it's not the Star Wars prequel, I groaned. She scoffed, as if you even had to say it. Oh, after what Jar Jar Abrams did to Star Trek, I'm not wasting time on that, Huey. See? Dream woman. Okay, so, um, how about Ant-Man? I asked. Oof, I haven't seen much in way of the Marvel movies. She shrugged. Got one you want to see, then? I asked as I stood up, slipping my huge work boots on. The boots, Cassandra joke, could be used as lifeboats in the event of a catastrophic flood. I don't know. What do you want to see? She asked, twirling a strand of that red hair around a finger. Very helpful, Foxy. Um, well, Mad Max Fury Road sounds like fun, I supplied. She tilted her head in thought. I'd shown her all three movies after I discovered our mutual love of Fallout, and she liked Thunderdome the most. Well, I'm more of a road warrior fan myself. Okay. Fury Road it is, she chirped. It was wonderful to see her cheering and smiling like this. She was shaky and paranoid the first month after her ordeal, but well, time, dates, and distracting schoolwork and recreation has got a way of helping you forget the horrors that have been visited upon you. I checked the listings on my phone, and the only showing that would conclude at a civilized time was at a drive-in theatre. It had been in town for as long as anyone could remember, near a trailer park. Every Sunday, there'd be a swap meet there, and on occasion, we'd pay a visit to see what second-hand goodies we could find. I mentioned this, and Cassandra hesitated, biting her lip anxiously. Hey, it's all right. We can wait for another showing. We'll find another movie, I said with a smile, scratching my fingers up and down her back the way she liked. No. No, it's okay. Let's go. I shouldn't let some scary crap define me for the rest of my life. She shot to her feet, 
a fist melodramatically thrust in the air. God, what a dork. What a beautiful, wonderful dork. Taking my truck, we stopped at a gas station on the way to grab snacks. Since movie theater snack prices are usually somewhere between kidney and firstborn child. But, at Cassandra's insistence, we got fresh popcorn from the concession stand. Oh, I've got to support the local business, after all. Fortunately, we like our popcorn the same way. Drenched in that fluid they somehow get away with calling butter, and generously salted to the point that the mere sight of the torso-sized tub of pop kernels caused our arteries to shrivel up like twigs. Armed with our gas station candy, sodas and popcorn, we drove to a spot, tuned the radio to the drive-in frequency, and relaxed. Ahead of us, another couple in a little blue Prius were watching, frequently tearing themselves away to steal kisses while the cocker spaniel dog in the back stole mouthfuls of popcorn. Well, I relaxed. Cassandra kept reaching into her purse to feel the comforting grip of her taser, the same one that had ended the life of her would-be murderer. She eventually settled down, sampled some popcorn, nibbled on her Snickers bar and sipped at her soda pop. The film was extremely exciting, and it drew Cassandra in. I kept looking over at her, making sure she felt comfortable and was enjoying herself. That was more important to me than the film. Around the time Max blew up the guy decked out in ammo, oh, I want that hat now, by the way, the intermission came. Fifteen minutes to get out of the car, relax, get a snack or use the facilities. Cassandra needed the latter most, and before asking me to go with her, I offered to escort her myself. Making sure I locked my truck, smiling reassuringly at her, I took her along to the restrooms. One of these brick affairs set up near the same building they kept the projectors in and sold concessions from. I waited outside and surveyed the dark landscape of cards, watching snacks and drinks dance invitingly on the screen. Yeah, real subtle. I leaned against the bricks near the women's restroom entrance, gazing up at the stars. You can make out most of them, given the small size of the towns around here. I heard jingling and clicking approaching from the drive through and glanced down, seeing the dog, that popcorn-stealing cocker spaniel, trotting along, leash trailing behind it. Uh-oh, looks like we got a jailbreaker, I exclaimed with a laugh, bringing my giant boot down on the leash before leaning down to seize it. Let's get you back to your folks, silly boy. I walked the dog back towards our spot, I noticed the car ahead of my truck had its driver door wide open and was completely empty. I glanced towards the concession stand, spotting a few people, but none of them looked like the couple from the car. I started to walk towards it, when the dog became immediately agitated, barking, growling and making a real fuss. Easy now, buddy. It's all right. I consoled the unhappy canine. I'm sure they're okay. That sounded like a hollow lie, even to myself. I slowly rounded the back of the couple's car and peered into the cabin. It was completely dark, so I fished out my phone and turned on the flashlight, shining it into the park Prius. Dark. Red. Soaking the upholstery and the console. Oh my god. I saw a bloody hand sticking out from under the car, and the dog let out a mournful whimper. I scooped him up under one arm and scrambled like the devil himself when nipping at my heels, darting back to the concession stand. I banged a fist on the door to the women's restroom. Occupied, Cassandra snarled from inside. Give me a minute. Cassie, baby, lock the door in there. Don't unlock it. I bellowed, then staggered to the concession stand, scaring the crap out of the poor, acne-riddled freshman with dark circles under his eyes, manning the place. Holy shit, dude! He yelped, bloodshot eyes widening in surprise. Listen, call the police. Someone's been hurt! I yelled. He stared at me for a few moments, jaw slack. Uh, what? A skeptical mumble struggled its way from his mouth. Murder. Call cops 
Freaking now, I bellowed, banging my fist on the counter for emphasis, then ran all the way back to the truck, panting hard. I tossed the dog into the back and snatched Cassandra's taser from her purse. I spun around just in time to see a dirty, haggard face framed by stringy, greasy hair and a pair of venomously angry, dark brown eyes boring into mine. I got a half second to let out a startled shout before I felt a cold impact in my abdomen, accompanied by a rigid stiffness. It was tapeworm, and he just buried an old kitchen knife in my belly. I could tell it had penetrated abdominal muscles, but where the knife wound up, it was mostly adipose that was pierced. And the thick shall inherit the earth. <laughs> I'm a gentle saw by nature, and can count on one hand the number of fights I've been in. One time when I was in 4-H, well, one more thing I have in common with Cassie, I held off a gang of kids from beating up my little brother. At Boy Scout camp, I got into a fight with a big lummox who picked on me excessively. And thirdly, I was shot in the torso by an idiot punk with his idiot girlfriend because they wanted to get into the fair after closing hours. I did the same thing when stabbed, that I did when shot. I became enraged. I have a deep-seated rage issue stemming from a ruined childhood at the hands of the ex-sister-in-law, the one I mentioned earlier, who tortured me whenever no one was around. From between when I was nine years old to when I was twelve, when my brother divorced her for unrelated reasons, well, I never told anyone what happened, save for the counsellors and... Frankly, that's a lengthy story for another time. But I always found outlets for that rage, so it never controlled me. Games. A little time at the sharpshooting range. A little kickboxing. It vented perfectly. But when this poor, broken and delusional man stabbed me, it was something he immediately regretted. My vision reddened and I leaped forward. The same way I had after that chiseled jaw punk put a bullet in me. I brought my fists down on him. Muscle torn from long hours on the farm and ranch I grew up on. Burning as I struck him across the face as he screamed. Son, get out the truck. Run away, boy. Get help. He cried to the cocker spaniel whose owners he'd butchered in a delusional stupor as I rained one blow after another down on him. You know that little bit of restraint you have? That restraint that keeps you from putting your full potential strength into a blow. That well-trained part of your super-ego that has told you it's not good to hit people. Well, in that moment, as in the three fights of my life before, that restraint fell away as I broke his jaw, cracked his cheekbone, felt his ribs crack under my unrelenting and brutal assault, as all the built-up rage, frustration, and grief inside me poured out into this man. Somewhere in all this fray, the knife had come out of me, and I was bleeding all over. By the time the police arrived, I was standing over him and was bringing a size 13 triple E work boot down on his femur, snapping it like a toothpick. All the while, the movie continued. It seems the kid in the booth was too shaken to think to turn it off. And while Immortan Joe was driving his souped-up hot rod on the big screen, the rest of the drive-in's patrons watched on, oblivious to the mayhem happening less than a hundred feet away. The cops shone their light on me. I heard them bellow at me to stop, and when I looked up at them, the rage burned still. And according to the dashcam footage I later saw, thanks to a friend of the family in the police department, they had just cause to believe I was about to attack them. This distraction, though, was enough for my gentle side, what I hope is my real self, to grab the reins again. The adrenaline rush ebbed, and after taking one step, my strength left me, like the blood of mine pooled around my feet. I collapsed. I have faint memories of Cassandra walking alongside the gurney that the paramedics had managed to get my giant self onto, holding my hand. She called me her warrior, her protector, her knight in shining armor. Please, no, baby, don't call me those things. 
She rode with me to the hospital, and I woke up to her and my family gathered around. Cassie's dorm mates were even there. Nicole, the activist girl. Jeannie, the nice but bubble-headed beauty queen who had yet to pick a major, and the perpetually cheerful and extra thick goth, Gloria. My brothers joked about how I needed to get a slash on my torso, and my battle damage would be complete after I've been shot and stabbed now. Mum and Dad were their usual, supportive selves. Cassandra kept calling me brave, heroic, and mighty. No, no, I'm none of those things. The detective who came to interview me, Jack Cunningham, explained that the couple that Tapeworm had attacked had not survived their injuries. Well, you really tore up that guy, Cunningham said. I felt sick to my stomach. And not because of the dull pain where I'd been stabbed, which was throbbing with infection that a cocktail of painkillers and antibiotics was battling. I looked away from him, trying to hide my shame. Then he grinned. Can't say he didn't deserve it, Cunningham said. No, God no, don't say that. Am I going to jail? I mumbled. This completely falls under self-defense, but you beat the guy to within an inch of his life, and he's probably going to end up in the funny farm, the detective said. This is what it took. This is what it takes before people who need it get sent someplace where they can't hurt others or themselves. Oh. I'll come back with more questions and paperwork, but you go on and heal up, hero. This is pretty cut and dry, he said, giving me a thumbs up on his way out. Friends and family drifted in and out over the next week, and even the pirate sent a card saying, Tape wasn't right in the head. Shame this happened. Get well soon, brother. He'd included a gift certificate for a big bottle of honey jacks. After I got out, I would frequently glance at the other homeless folk. No, not because I was afraid of being attacked, but looking for a scowl, a frown, a dirty look, something... Anything to validate how loathsome I felt. Nothing off the salt. Why couldn't people see in me what I know exists? I finally went back to my dorm, hand in hand with Cassandra in one, and the leash of the newly adopted Cocker Spaniel in the other. And after sitting down, I hammered this whole story out. The monster I mentioned when I began? No, it wasn't tapework. Beating a handicapped man with no control over his actions got labelled a heroic act. It sure as hell doesn't feel heroic. The monster I refer to lives inside me. The hide to my jackal. I know, on the surface, that I'd never hurt the ones I love, even when angry. But a primal fear always hides deep down. Our brains are divided into many different parts. Know why you get a headache looking at optical illusions? That's your brain arguing over what it's seen. Whatever part of my brain that monster lives in, I pray to all that's good and holy that it's never unleashed again. That's why I've gone back to counselling. Cassandra says she's proud of me for it. She's the only one I've ever told any of this to. Well, until now. And I'll tell you all what she told me. You're worth healing. You're worth helping. You're worth being happy. I implore you, friends. Battle those demons in your soul. And don't do it alone. Once we graduate, I'm going to ask Cassandra to marry me. My tabletop game friends, Raoul and Mandy, gave me an engagement ring to give to her when the time's right. Well, I'm thinking Pismo Beach at the end of the pier. Right when the moon is hovering over the ocean. Just not at a drive-in movie any time soon. Well, I'm going to have to get quite a move on if I want to keep this one to spot on the hour. Thanks once again to all of you for listening. I hope you enjoyed these two drive-in movie theatre stories. And of course, I'll be back again very, very soon. Till the next time, very, very sweet dreams and bye-bye. Oh, look at that. Spot on the hour again. Can you believe it? <laughs>